Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another seminar as part of the Health Equity Seminar Series brought to you by the CTS ICN. We're happy to have you with us this morning to discuss improving your participant recruitment mindset, barriers to enrollment among African American females. Today we'll be joined by Dr. Madison Burrell, who is a pediatric neuropsychologist at Children's National. She also serves as the faculty co-lead for the ELRIC, which is the recruitment and retention uh, arm of the CTSICN. Um, unfortunately, we were to be joined today by Daisy, Dr. Daisy Lee, but she had a family emergency and wasn't able to join us. She is an assistant professor with the GW School of Nursing and also a behavioral scientist. We're also joined by Dr. Stephanie Salazar, who has a background in community psychology and serves as the senior administrator for the CTSICN. Also joined by Chioma Oru, who is a community and family centered advocate and consultant and founder of Chi Born Free. And finally, we're also joined by Ms. Darcel Jackson, a certified patient and family coordinator and also a parent navigator and advisor for the Patient Family Advisory Council at Children's National. To begin, we'll start with Dr. Stephanie Salazar, who will discuss a systematic review of self-identified barriers to clinical trial enrollment among African-American women. Please take it away, Dr. Salazar. Thank you. Thank you, Joran. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, as uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just give a, a general outline of what we're going to be discussing today. Um, so to begin with, uh, we'll provide a brief overview of what we know from a research point of view about what the barriers are to enrollment among African American women in clinical trials through this systematic review that was conducted by our team and then Dr. Burrell will sort of complete this picture with the results of a survey our team conducted about recruitment strategies in our research community here at GWN Children's. And she, Dr. Burrell, will start addressing how to improve recruitment by what she likes to call um, adopting a recruitment mindset. Um, and then we will give the floor to our invited panelists here today so they can sort of react to this academic point of view or academic perspective on recruitment with their on the ground experience um, and insights on what recruitment looks like and feels like for African-American women um, and African-American communities. And we would love also to hear uh, your questions and your reactions. So we ask you to keep those questions to towards the end. We promise to keep these first presentations rather short so that we can give more space to that discussion. So let me begin with the systematic review. Thank you, John. Um, and I can set the stage just with a little context um, with what is already well known that health disparities continue to persist for African-Americans and particularly for African-American women. We continue to see health disparities in cardiovascular disease with higher prevalence of CBD risk factors and mortality. We continue to see health disparities in hypertension, diabetes, and cancer with higher death rates for nearly all cancers in African-American women. Um, and yet, uh, the low inclusion of African-American women in clinical trial research also persists. Clinical trials are research, it's, it, a clinical trial is a research study in which one or more human subjects are prospectively assigned to one or more interventions to evaluate the effects of those interventions. Clinical trials are therefore the research that provide the essential data for the rational use of new treatments and have led to the development of life-saving medications, medical procedures, and innovative healthcare technologies. And these, these medications, these treatments could not have reached the public if not for that assessment of their safety and efficacy 
um, through clinical trials. Um, and so according to a report commissioned by the NIH, minorities constitute 37% of the 17.6 million individuals enrolled in NIH registered clinical trials. And African-Americans make up only 15% of those minority participants. Um, and so therefore it can be said that African-American women um, are in, 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 in greater need of treatment and medications because of the health disparities that we've mentioned. And yet they are not being included in the design of those treatments and medications. The consequence of this is of course that if a subset of a population is underrepresented or excluded, pertinent information on the proper use and efficacy of a particular treatment within that subpopulation will be lacking. So the, the point that we're trying to make here is that <clears throat> this means insufficiently tested treatments and medications for African-American women and for their children. Um, we, we consider here uh, also that African-American women are the gatekeepers to um, the gatekeepers of their children's treatment services and participation in clinical trials. So uh, the point here is that by not addressing the barriers that African-American women face uh, to enroll in clinical trials, we are excluding their participation uh, in the design of these treatments and medication and also excluding the participation of their children. And so <clears throat> this picture that I am drawing here is not something new. Um, in fact, in 1993, faced with this reality, the NIH signed into law a policy that requires scientists to, um, to enroll women and ethnic and racial minorities into clinical trials. So scientists really are now required by law to enroll women and, and, and minorities, to examine sex and gender differences in clinical trial outcomes. <clears throat> this, this law forbids the use of cost as a reason for their exclusion. And it also uh, has the requirement for scientists to <clears throat> report about their enrollment uh, for their funded st studies. And so uh, this is the NIH Revitalization Act of 1993. And despite this act, we, we, we see that enrollment continues to be low. Um, and therefore it is of, of, of high importance to better understand what the barriers are, what reasons are behind this low enrollment, specifically for African-American women. For this reason, our team conducted a systematic review <coughs> of the perceived and self, sorry, <coughs> identified barriers to clinical trial enrollment. Um, next slide, please. So I'll just go very briefly through the, the methodology. Um, we considered only peer reviewed journal articles for this a systematic review, those published between 2000 and 2019. Uh, we focused only on the perceived and experienced barriers to enrollment in clinical research among African-American women uh, and uh, considered ages 18 and older. We use PubMed and Google Scholar databases. And with, this, with these criteria, we identified 11 peer-reviewed peer journal articles um, <clears throat> on the subject. Next slide. And so I will give really just a brief description of the results. The, the results of this review show that there are four main barriers that are mentioned um, for clinical trial enrollment. And those are the ones that you see here. So mistrust in the medical and scientific community, fear of experimentation and randomization, safety and efficacy of procedures and medications and logistical concerns. Um, I want to say that we know that barriers can cover all the three different levels that are shown in this figure. So we know there are, there are systemic barriers to clinical trial enrollment that have to do with the infrastructure of, of hospitals um, and, and clinics. 
that have to do with poor access to primary medical care and lack of health insurance and so on and so forth. The, the barriers that were identified in this review pertain more to the other two levels, which are relationship and individual. We mean by relationship, we mean uh, the relationship between uh, doctor patient relationship and researcher participant relationship. So those barriers are the first three that you see listed here. And the individual um, barriers have to do more with either low knowledge of clinical trials or logistical concerns, which is what we found here in this review. And I will, um, I will read out a quote of each of these barriers that will make them self-explanatory. So <clears throat> for the first, which is mistrust in the medical and scientific community, the quote is, black women are less willing to participate in research we're too suspicious and one thing we don't trust are studies. There's trickery, not just Tuskegee, but that was a big one that a lot of people remember. So that, that would be the first one. For fear of experimentation and randomization, the quote is, I know guinea pig, I'm not getting stuck with no needles or no vaccination that they don't even know what it is. They don't know if it's prevented, preventing AIDS or not. So this was from a study specifically about AIDS. About um, safety and efficacy of procedures and medications, the quote is, I can't do it because 10 years from now, I might be sick from that stuff and I don't want to sacrifice myself. And the last barrier from logistical concerns, which in the review, uh, they mention a lot around caregiving, um, duties and time concerns. The quote is, is regarding time concerns and goes, time is a big one because we live in a fast paced world. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into a year long research study. That's just another slice of my time, my pie. I have to really evaluate that and really weigh it out. So those those are the quotes that sort of explain what these barriers are. <clears throat> I'm going to stop right here. Um, these findings, the findings from the systematic review are consistent uh, in general with the, with the literature in this field. And hopefully it provides this first literature point of view. And I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Burl, who's gonna give us more of the researcher point of view. Thank you, Dr. Salazar. So just to sort of complement what was found in a systematic review from what are, what's the perspective of the, um, the participants, we also conducted a survey um, among investigators within um, both institutions of George GW, George Washington and children. Next slide. And so we asked them a lot of different questions about recruitment um, and retention, um, but I'm just giving you the ones that are relevant to the, uh, the findings that are relevant to this particular talk. So we had 254 investigators respond, um, pretty evenly split, split between Children's National and, and George Washington. Um, and one of the first questions is just how often do you meet your recruitment goals? And what you see is that about 60% of the researchers meet their goals most of the time or always. But that leaves 40% that are not meeting their goals. And this is presumably, uh, you know, funded studies for the most part. And people have put a lot of effort just setting them up. And 40% of the time, they're not meeting their re recruitment goals. Um, in terms of sort of the other side of retaining participants, if it's a longitudinal study or for follow-up studies um, of, of any sort, um, there's a little bit of a difference between working with kids perhaps and adults where more of the children's researchers um, have an easier time, about 55%, compared to only a quarter of GW researchers that have an easier, very easy time um, retaining those participants. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Next slide. The reasons um, 
that the researchers believe research participants don't wish to enroll in studies are pretty consistent with what we found in the systematic review. Um, so, and this isn't necessarily specific to African American women, um, but certainly there's going to be a cohort um, involved in all the studies that that we have in DC, uh, given the makeup of our of our population. But the top three reasons were sort of this, you know, indirect cost to the participant just to come to an uh, an appointment. So do, do you have to take off t time away from work? And if you are somebody that is uh, ha on a tighter budget or living paycheck to paycheck, you know, even that $30, you know, participation stipend that you give them isn't going to cover a day's worth of work. Um, then do they have to, you know, by them going to the appointment, are they going to have to, you know, get someone to take care of their own child if, they're, if it's for them? or the other children and if it's for only one of their children and then there's travel expenses just getting to the places where studies are conducted and if this is outside of a normal clinic visit it's an extra trip um, so thinking about those for sure is is important um, the lack of awareness about research in general so this goes back to the idea that dr salazar brought up that if you already have a disparity in terms of the access and going to your normal clinic visits, even just for a mom to go to her own um, annual visit. I know so many across all uh, moms across all different populations that just don't even take care of their own primary care visit. And if you're not even showing up in clinic for your visit, are you not even giving yourself a chance to know or be told about the research in general? And so that general lack of access, whether it's because they're busy, because they don't have health care coverage, you're just you're not even giving them the opportunity to hear about this research study. Um, and then again, the distrust, the fear, and the suspicion of being involved in a research study, which inherently has a question of we don't know what's going to happen. So that, that engenders um, all of these feelings. And so the, the investigators understand that. What we hope to have a conversation about today is that especially these last two ones could be modifiable through our community education. And so that's what we're hoping and hoping to generate some ideas about. Next slide. Lastly, I'll get to this in a, in a little bit, but basically what, what are investigators committing to recruitment and retention in terms of budget dollars? And it does cost money to think about these things and be proactive. And most investigators actually don't have any funding allocated to re, re, recruitment and re, retention. So you can see that in the gray. So about 40% on both sides of children's as well as GW have zero dollars. And then of the of the investigators that have dollars accumulated, it really is. Uh, uh, um, uh, planned for recruitment and retention, um, that really ranges anywhere from $500, which probably isn't going to cover a lot, to $10,000. And so you can really see that, um, you know, having big social media blitzes or commercials or things like that could really cost a lot of money as well as the um, personnel costs. And so it really, you could invest a lot, but if you have a $2 million study and you put in 10,000 to make sure that the study is going to get the right number of people, that's a worthy investment. And so we're going to come back to budget because I think for investigators, this is certainly something that, um, you know, I actually haven't thought about. And I think that's true for a lot of people. Next slide. So we're going to start to kind of get into our recruitment mindset here. So um, this is just more facts that we started to touch on about, um, you know, recruitment to clinical trials. So only 1% of, you know, and, and why we need to focus on recruitment, only 1% of the population actually participates in health studies. 30% um, of trial sites fail to even recruit a single participant. That's a pretty high failure rate. 
And then less than 10% of studies actually are completed on time. And we know that time ends up being, um, you know, a cost in terms of getting results out, getting new treatments, you know, out. The longer we take to recruit and get those results, the longer we get to market and having new um, options for us in, in the healthcare arena. Um, again, in terms of it, it, it gets worse for minorities, um, women and minorities in 2015, out of 45 novel drugs approved and with 105,000 participants in those trials, only 40% were women and only 5% were African American. And so this really comes to the point of, you know, eliminating racism and racial inequities begins with eliminating disparities in health. And so if you're not well, you're not able to prosper. And that necessarily demands deliberate and purposeful inclusion in health research, which again, as Dr. Salazar mentioned, will help us lead to equitable access and outcomes and ensuring that the generalizability of our results um, is applicable to everybody in our population. Next slide. So this comes you know, I, I sort of the argument of, you know, as investigators, we need our recruitment mindset to change and to really have a recruitment mindset. Um, we know that effective participant recruitment is vital to the success, success of our clinical trials. We, I, I want to urge you that it's as important as any other component in your research. We spend so much time on our hypotheses, our methods, but really, it will not run if you do not think about those people that are participating. Um, you could have the best idea in the world, but you cannot carry it out. Um, and like many things, you know, there's a lot going on in the world today and um, our ability to have a diversity oriented community and patient engagement strategy really extends to clinical research as well as all the other social issues we've been talking about. So having that same mindset and openness and willingness to learn and be aware is critical to what we're doing. Next slide. So many of us haven't had a recruitment and retention plan. And so I kind of just wanted to go through the components of that. And um, so, and through this, we'll kind of talk through some different ideas and hopefully this is what we'll discuss a little bit later. But basically you have a recruitment strategy. This is pretty much the basics. Who are you gonna recruit? Where are you gonna recruit them from? Is this single site, multi-site? Is this in the schools? Is this in community clinics? Is that the hospital? Um, and then your kind of basic inclusion, exclusion criteria. Um, do you have evidence of your feasibility to to do this recruitment of these of the people that you're thinking about recruiting? Um, we have some nice tools, you know, with our electronic health records where we can now search according to different criteria. Do you are they even registered in the hospital? Um, do you have your own registry of patients you've worked with or other registries that you think are relevant to your study question? Do you have your past work? Um, the other thing to think about in terms of feasibility is, do you have other studies in your division or your hospital or the community that might be competing with trying to work with the population you're interested in? Um, again, are there barriers to availability, accessibility? We talked about this transportation, time of day, um, day of the week, you know, have you thought about those? You know, having someone be able to come in at two o'clock on a Tuesday really doesn't work for most working families. Um, and then most importantly, do you have a plan to overcome this? Can you have vouchers for Ubers? You know, have you considered a Saturday clinic for um, research um, or for normal access to care that would, you know, then allow you to talk about the research. Um, in terms of recruitment and retention, it really is a team. So no longer is it just the PI's job to think about this. Maybe a lot of us talk about a study coordinator, but have you, you know, engaged and talked about including a community member 
or someone who is specialized with outreach and being an outreach coordinator. Um, you know, this is not just, can you help me do my study? But outreach means you are doing something for the community in, in return. And that is part of establishing this relationship that really needs to happen um, in order to have a strong, you know, recruitment and retention plan. And it's more than just a, yes, I'm going to do this. It's actual events. And so planning those out really requires a team. Um, I will say um, for the Center for Autism Spectrum Disorders, they um, hired a community outreach coordinator about three years ago, an African-American woman, Yetta Myrick, who, who also has um, a child with autism. And so her ability to um, you know, recruit and talk about studies was um, really critical to improving their ability to have diverse children with autism be interested in their studies. Um, recruitment and retention methods. So across all the study phases from awareness to screening to consenting, enrolling and retaining, have you considered how you're going to communicate and talk with your participants um, or potential participants? Um, what methods are you going to use? Flyers, social media? What metrics are you going to use? How are you going to assess how you're doing? Because that's really you know, some hard data can help you understand what's happening here and, and when you need to, to really intervene and think uh, of a new strategy if it doesn't work. And again, costs. Costs are really important that we often um, are not thought about. Stakeholder communication. This is, I think, the fundamental sort of cornerstone to making all these other pieces work. Conveying progress and results across sites within a team and to the study participants in the community. Again, across all study phases, we'll talk about this more in a second. You need to have this communication um, back and forth and that will increase your success. Um, obviously having a timeline, so any criteria for a slow start, really having trigger points for when you might terminate, terminate a site. So if a site really is just taking resources but hasn't enrolled anybody, you may ha have to figure out what is your stop point to say, we're not going to try anymore there. And really the thing that we ho really hope for all of us but need to be more aware of is whether we need to terminate our own study because we're just not getting the enrollment and we're not going to be able to answer the question. Um, that leads us to evaluation, you know, um, why aren't we doing it? So whether you're asking the participants that did enroll, but also those that who dropped out, or perhaps if you're lucky, even those that decide not to enroll, can you get some information from them so that can help you for the next time to be more successful? And again, we've talked about budget, budget, budget. This work requires an investment, and that is dollars. So you do need time for personnel for this team we talked about, incentives, uh, cab rides, um, higher you know, pay to offset somebody taking off a day of work, um, or being able to move through the study more quickly so they can get back to work more quickly. Um, all these um, advertising activities, um, paying for, you know, different ways to communicate and then how you're going to overcome the barriers that, that we're starting to talk about. Next slide. So these next two slides are really just examples and more for um, your reference, but I want to point you to the, um, that's actually a link down below um, the multi-regional clinical trials of Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard. They held a bioethics collaborative really about this issue, that it's an ethical issue that we are not more diverse in our recruitment to clinical trials. And they have a number of resources. And this slide, as well as the next slide, are pulled from their guides and guidance that is sort of an evolving um, what website they add new tools all the time about how 
um, to think about these and ideas about how how to check yourself. So these are the performance indicators. You know, have you established a process for um, you know including the voice of the, that subpopulation that you're wanting to 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 be um, part of your study? Have you included them in trial design? Um, so for example, um, if you're having a study that you want them to come back to the clinic every two weeks, again, we talked about this, that's a half a day potentially of pay that they're going to miss every two weeks. Is that really feasible? Do you have to do it every two weeks? Uh, could you do it, um, uh, you know, monthly instead? Could you do it on a Saturday instead? Um, could you do it at night instead? So kind of thinking about the design and how, how you include their voice about the feasibility of them being able to stick with this design. Um, the number of partnerships. Have you, have you actually established any par partnerships with a patient advocacy or community organization? If that number is zero, that's a performance indicator to you that you have maybe a, a situation where you're not you're not going to be successful. And then, how many in-person meetings have you held with that population to guide that study line and recruitment planning? So it's one thing to get a couple emails, but have you actually had a discussion with an in-person meeting? Um, other indicators would be proportion of you know the participant facing materials that have been reviewed by advocates or patients um, so that you can kind of get some feedback. You only have your perspective. So why don't you get the perspective of the person that you're trying um, to interest into your study? Um, again, what is the proportion of clinical trials with patient feedback processes at the end of the study with the patient of the population? So have you, have you learned from the studies that you have done about who, why they are or not able to be in the study. Um, and then again, the, the community advisory boards, have you established that for your target population? Again, having that established already um, gives you a very quick way to get feedback rather than having to find everybody and then you set a meeting. If you already have something in place, it really facilitates that, that communication much better. Next slide. So, um, so this is just, again, some checklists from that same website about across the different aspects of a study, um, what you might be thinking about as an investigator. Um, and ways to promote engagement. So again, many of these, as you can see, build relationships with the community. That should be the message um, and the communication, reaching out to local institutions and community leaders and clinics and clinicians, creating the advisory board. Um, sorry, Joanne, you're, you're blocking the screen. Um, so incorporating again, novel study designs that support diverse and I can't, you know, we, we all think, oh, participants will be so happy and to come in 20,000 times over the next year. And it's just not real life. And so can we, you know, establish enough power to answer the question that we need to ask, but maybe not with the burden of, um, so many study um, visits or with um, coronavirus, perhaps our telemedicine um, advances can help us with research with being more doing more tele research and rather than having the, the patient come into the cl clinic for every um, study checkup visit. So again, being creative, um, you know, understanding um, materials and getting feedback from the community. These are nice checklists to kind of think about what you can do as a, uh, as a, a researcher. Next slide. So um, we're, we sort of are at the, the discussion point, hopefully, and um, I'd like to invite Dr. Uru and Ms. Jackson to kind of react and um, give us some of their experience in, in terms of, you know, is this picture that we've painted um, 
accurate and um, what they see and, and um, start the discussion for us. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I think I provided some, uh, having had some time to think about this and uh, also based on what we've been presented with today. Um, in the next slide, I just offered some ideas and thoughts that I think uh, really match up well uh, to some of the recommendations from that last study. Uh, I, so my thoughts are just that there, I have more of a why and why not questions in my mind, right? Like, why has, why is it important today to address considering how many years of not including, um, you know, black people and black women, particularly um, in these studies, what is the now of it and, and why, why is, why is now relevant? Um, and also the why not is why, why haven't these seem pretty uh, consistent, uh, at least in my discipline of political science and just even in my experience as a community organizer, community advocate um, around health and education, um, you know, it, communities want more input. Um, people want more input in every arena in which decision making is happening for our lives. So why have we not yet been um, included? Why is the investment not been there? And I'm hoping that, um, you know, we can consider some underlying things that possibly can um, influence not even just what clinical teams do, but how you prepare somebody to uh, be a clinician. Um, again, you know, I, I think I was taught that method matters, right? I was taught that how you go about it, um, you know, really determines what kind of results you're going to get. So if in the preparation of uh, clinical researchers, they're not grappling with broader concepts and broader ideas, like one, one of my favorite thoughts and what defines pretty much everything that I do in the community is around this concept of decolonization, that you, we have to recognize that I think the concept of black life in America um, is clouded with a lot of imposition, a lot of imposition as to what we do, when we do it, how we do it, who we do it with. And that's historical trauma. And that's the political reality of our lives. I think that those who seek to extract information from us, even for the benefit of the greater good, have to remember that without understanding when you trigger or when you hit certain, um, when you close certain doors with people, um, it's likely because you have, you know, infringed on some very precious uh, element of themselves that's linked to their freedom, that's linked to their self-determined ability to decide what they want to do. So researchers have to be aware of that. Um, I think interdisciplinary, you know, is a term that people use legally to define how you go about things. It's used scientifically to decide, but I think that for the community appeal, for the recruitment appeal, um, it's also good to have even in the training and then also in whatever teams come up, have different kinds of minds that are thinking about these problems. No man is an island and no clinician is going to achieve their goals. So I really appreciate Dr. Burroughs, um, the recommendations that were just cited around an advisory board, around community partners. I think those are essential, those are basic and, and giving them real access and real power to influence. It's one thing to say, hey, I have this design and this is only like, I'm presenting you something I've already created um, and I want your input on that versus from the start, even from your, your proposal, be in partnership um, and be in real partnership where input and, and, you know, as you mentioned, both of you, Dr. Salazar and Dr. Burrow, budgets matter. Like, I will believe that you really want to be a partner when you invest 
right? Um, when you invest in the time, the energy, and the resources. And that's what it takes to create true interdisciplinary practices. Um, intentional integration of, you know, non-clinical methods, um, like uh, the decolonized methods that uh, Linda Smith to Suwahini, I don't want to mess that up, said she's an uh, indigenous Native American, um, but she speaks broadly, including the experience of Black people. Um, and, and, that, and, and I also want to say that Black is not a monolith. When you say African American, you're going to have to have different strategies to, um, to inter interact with different populations. There's geographic considerations, there's um, ethnic and cultural um, considerations, there's linguistic considerations, there's you know, gender specific, socioeconomic. I mean, you, uh, to have an intersectional lens when you unpack those barriers. Are certain barriers more prevalent based and, and ability? I also want to mention that if you're if you're doing a clinical study for people who have already a pre-existing condition, like ableism will, you know, ruin any chance of accessing them if you cannot respect their barriers and limitations. And I think some of that was um, presented in transportation, but it's also in in literacy, like uh, or even just accessibility is phone. Do people have internet access? If you want to say you have telehealth, do people have phone access? Do, are they economically safe? You know, do you have safe housing? Like all the social determinants really impact, should impact your method. Um, and they should be respectful. I think that's maybe one element that I didn't really see previously is that respect factor, um, that it's not just solving a very linear problem. It's also recognizing, you know, the, the cyclical nature of it, that you are giving back and you're taking from, and that transaction is not equal. If you have a $2 million budget and $10,000 is what you've allotted to recruitment, is that truly the highest investment you can make? Um, what is your purpose and what is your reason for conducting the study? Where is the res Where are the resources actually going and coming back to? That also is a method question. And, and lastly, I believe deeply, almost religiously in, um, you know, in action research. And I think that goes back to the preparation. And that is the, I think, key to decolonial methods. If the clinicians are coming outside of the community um, and not knowing anything about where they intend to impact or who they intend to extract from for the greater good and have not taken the time, it's a key part of respect, find a way to be part of that community. And I, I mean, I, I do more organizing than I do research, even though I could very much do research, because I find that in organizing, I'm approaching the community in much more respectful ways that even if I may take analytical, you know, I may analyze what's happening, I may present it, I may use it. There is that nature of where I feel I am a part or I feel invested if I'm not um, a part of the community. And, and that gives me, and I'm constantly in a feedback loop, right? With the people in which I impact. I think that that is um, things that within my discipline of black po politics and political science, like we know that is critical to respecting the people in which we impact. And I think that has a place in the clinical field. So I'll stop there. So I don't, I, I totally agree with um, Dr. Ura and not being a researcher or not being a community activist or, 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 or um, doing the wonderful work that, that you um, do Dr. Uru and as well as Dr. Salazar and Beryl. I'm coming from a, of, of, a, of an individual who has herself participated in, in, in research as well as um, having a child with um, chronic um, and, and severe sp uh, special needs who has as well. So I'm coming from a, a little bit different perspective, but I, but I think it all leads to the same thing, is community engagement, I think, is really probably the most important factor. But I think we have to also think about not just the research, right? I think we need to think about the lack of diversity among the researchers themselves 
and the clinical professionals and really invest in our community in that aspect to, to, to train up individuals in the communities to understand research and how important and vital it is to our community. And that way we can start to work on how do we educate our community, lay education on, on what research is, what's the importance of it, and then get them involved. How do we get individuals to join an IRB so that we're building, a, not we're not just learning about research from our clinicians and our professions, but we're learning it from within our own community on why it matters, why it's important beyond just the, the dollar savings. And because, and, and I think what also happens is there's this, there's this perception and, and, and there are, but it doesn't show why things are the way they are. So the media, if often presents as Blacks and African Americans as having such a high, high um, amount of issues regarding to health and you know high blood pressure and so and diabetes etc but not the why and so there are some 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 times where you you don't want to do that because you don't want to add to that that perception and, and and the racism and the prejudice that goes into that is that I am I now also contributing to the perception that we just don't take care of ourselves, right? That we, we, we just refuse to do A, B, C, and D, which is not accurate, but I think we can do a better job of even how we share information that it is, it is disseminated into the communities, into the, into the media that, 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 that looks very differently than how it is presented now. And then I think following up also on what happens afterwards? The, do we know what were the results of, of, of the clinical studies and the clinical trials and how it benefits in our community? So it, it takes away that mistrust and that we're used just as guinea pigs because then we're not followed up on, on, on what, do, what impact does it make and how does it help us as a community? And that we're using our community leaders, we're using our churches and we're using community health fairs and community activists and social organizations and, and partnership with our HBCUs and, 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 and sororities and fraternities to all I mean, really just think outside of the box, how do we use the, the community itself to help educate on the importance of it? Because it's not, it can't work if it's really just coming from the outside when there is a level of mistrust. And so it has to come where we, we are re-educating ourselves even on why we should do it, why it's important, what's the value and what difference it's gonna make in our lives. I think that's well said. I. I, I'm just thinking of, you know, having these experiences where you don't even realize all the different facets you might be touching on. So if I give a talk and a whole family is there, yes, there's the patient, but oftentimes there's siblings. And we've heard so many times where siblings, because of their sick brother or sister may be interested in medicine or science. And I've had conversations with the siblings about what do you do and how do you do? And I think it's the first time they've ever, they don't get to go to the doctor's visits. And so I, I just think these, these community engagement opportunities are beyond, like you're saying, and I think the more we can be out there and, and you know, bring up the whole community in many ways is is the value in it. Um, it's beyond just getting the numbers up. And I just I that's what I'm hearing both of you guys say. And I just I I really think that's important. Yeah, I I, I agree with you, Dr. Burrow. Um, I, and I think both of our panelists. I think the insights that you brought are really, really important. Um, I wanna provide some space for our audience to see if they have any questions, any comments. Now is, to is the time to do that. Feel free to unmute yourself, speak up, or put something on the chat if you're more comfortable that way. And I, I have a question yeah. when you, when for both, you know, Ms. Jackson and Dr. Oru, this, the engagement and um, you, you're an organizer, especially, do you have any, you know, I think there's a lot of people that say, I don't know where to start. 
like what what do you have any thoughts about that you know because I think you know that's what I'm asking I have thoughts you I want to hear your thoughts <laughs> Okay, so I'll, I'll go. Um, I think that it's important to start, um, you know, in theory, right? Like, I mean, that's that's where we start in research. And your, what is your theory of change? Like, how do you, um, what do you, what do you, what are you trying to actually accomplish here, and what informs that? Um, and while that seems like it's a vacuum conversation, and it's happening in your mind, um, I think that you all have done a great job of you know, like reviewing the literature. I mean, I feel like that should be a process in which every researcher kind of is prepared for, maybe not in the in the moment of one opportunity that they have to make impact in one way, but if they have a working thought, it's going to guide a, a thought of inclusion, a thought of, um, equity, a thought of diversity, and they and they find and they plant those seeds in whatever their theoretical framework may be, um, it's going to lead to, to those steps. It's going to lead them down that road one way or the other. I think that um, I guess more concretely, um, you know, you you want to just start informally communicating with people, um, you know, before you pull out a pen and before you submit your proposal, you should be trying to have communications um, with people. And if you don't have immediate people, like we in the internet age, you can Google, you can be like, all right, I'm new to this community. I don't know anything. I'm going to Google X, Y, and Z church. I'm going to Google X, Y, and Z, you know, fraternal organization, or I'm going to show up at this community meeting that I saw on Facebook, just to be able to get a feel of the environment in which I'm, I'm intending to impact. I think that that has integrity. Um, and, and you're not going there to extract, you're going there to understand, to be informed, so you can then um, continue on in what in your in the extractive nature that research really does have. Yeah. And the only thought that I have that I think is important is 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 in that as as Dr. Oru mentioned is 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 being informed by the community is learning what's important to them allow the community to kind of help set their research agenda that may help steer um, what's important to them to and to and, and 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 help guide even what you're looking to so there's a, there's a mesh of that that if there if it's not if what you're researching is not important to them or you can't show how it's going to impact them I don't really know what what is the what is the desire for them to participate when it when it's not going to show any really results for them you know we, we already talked about they, they may not be um, you know paid for time or for or, or for travel and, and logistics and childcare and all that. So what is in it for them, especially if it's not an issue that's important to them. So I, I think you have to really marry what your interests are, but what the community wants for themselves. And and based on what you've said before, it sounds like that really begins long before your doing your clinical trials. So there's so many elements that need to be covered, whether it's training, whether it's you know establishing that long-term relationship with the community that is there um, to help inform what are the important um, or the issues that are important to those communities. And all of that is supposed to be in place even before we decide to do a clinical trial or which clinical trial we're supposed to be uh, doing. Um, there is a question that has been put on the chat, so I'll, 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 I'll repeat it here out for you. What would you suggest to get study coordinators trained on, on how to approach diverse communities instead of having a one-fit-all approach? What would you suggest to get study coordinators trained on yeah, um, I, I think, hmm. so 
one, I think sometimes, like I said, like I suggested before, like it's good to look at what, how other disciplines in the social sciences may approach, but also at the core of it all, I think I mentioned um, in a previous conversation that I think that if, um, if researchers developed more tools as provided by organizers, um, they would get a lot further um, in that. And, and that's just implementing basic tools of organization. I, um, I am a student and I've studied the Alinsky model. There are other models of organizing people, which is a faith-based, I mean, there are different models of organizing. You pick what works for you. And I think with the Alinsky model, you know, you, you begin to learn how to cultivate relationships. Relationships are everything. Like if you don't have those relationships and you don't know how to make, um, you know, interest-based relationships, that these are not familial relationships, these are not um, platonic kind of relationships, these are interests, these are power relationships, right? So that means when you're going into a community, I mean, and there's a study of it. So to implement some of that intelligence and in how you um, develop your coordination skills, I mean, it takes a certain kind of politic to understand what it is to run a board, an advisory board, right? Like. How do you decide your stakeholders? Um, how do you weigh what your stakeholders provide to what you want to do or what your your proposal? I mean, these are studies of, of brokering, of power brokering, um, and as well as just community relations. Um, so I think that that is a foundational knowledge um, that can help in better coordination that is community-centered people first and people-centered in their nature, family-centered, in fact. I'll just add to that. I think so many people pick research co coordinators that are straight out of college that have energy and that's great, but they don't have a lot of relationship experience of what you're saying. And so I think some of the groups that have picked um, more experienced people um, that are about relationships have even picking their coordinator has a different mindset right and I think exactly if if the skill set you need for people to be available 24 7 and enter data is one skill set but if you're really talking about your recruitment team and that role that's a different skill set and so I think what's interesting is that even the role of research coordinator can really should be diverse, you know, mixed up and maybe it's two different people um, because there's a different skill set that comes with it. And I, I don't think we always think of that. Um, and, and not to give the 20 year olds a bad rap, they do a great job, but sometimes they just don't have that people experience yet, you know, <laughs> so, um, we love them in many other ways, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I, I think it, it, I think there's traditions and, you know, when we talk about these, these past experiences, hierarchy of how you get to be exposed and you know how you get to medical school being a research assistant is one of those ways and 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 to disrupt that in a way might scare some people you know um but i think that's you know hopefully um maybe what we're reconsidering so I just want to add really, really quickly that um, I think it's also important to look at the identity of the people that carry out these roles. Um, I mean, I uh, focus on disabilities, focus on um, diverse populations impacting Black women because I'm a Black woman. I'm a mother of children with disabilities. My ability to understand that reality, um, granted, you know, there are people who are not, don't have my identity that have had to learn otherwise and they have a there's a place for them, but they, they, it should not be underestimated the importance of the diversity of the researchers themselves, right? And the people who are part of the, those who are doing the coordination, if they don't have that innate lived experience, sometimes it's a really tall order to ask them to stretch 
it's possible, but you know, it's it's also nice to invest in the communities. We have a, a couple of more questions that have appeared on our chat. Um, so uh, I'll read the next one. First, thank you for the insightful discussion. And the question is, do you see the clinical research sponsors, biopharmaceutical, uh, medical device companies, for example, being able to directly help with overcoming some of these barriers? Like I always feel bad. There's a silence, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a realist, you know, materialist. I think that people function from their interests. Uh, you know, part of, part, you, you always have to make a case, right? Like, so part of advocacy is like it's never going to be easy to to convince powerful people to do things that aren't easy for them to do. So your job is to make it easy and make it make sense, and and you have to sell it to those parties where their interests fall. I mean, for a business like a pharmaceutical company, I mean, the interest is the bottom line, right? And you have to figure out a way to, you know, I think an effective team lead and effective um, coordinator or somebody who is the, the lead researcher has to be able to broker um, with the grass tops and the grassroots. That's why you would be in that position. And I think part of the grass top strategy is really helping them understand their interests in the community inclusion aspect of it. It may not be an easy sell, you may get many no's, but I think integrity means staying at it till you get the door open, till you figure out the right argument, till you make the right case. And you know, yeah, we, we have barriers in front of us in terms of how things, that's why things have been going on. That's part of the answer to the why, right? Like why has this gone on for so long? So we just have to get better skilled people who can make better cases to kind of change the playing field based on where we are right now. Yeah, and I, I would just add, you know, it, that goes back to doing things differently. You know, some of the device or other um, trial designs, they give you the device, but everything else, you know, the, the surgery to implant it, things like that is usually covered by insurance. So what if you don't have insurance? You know, so there's, the, you just need to rethink about how, um, you know, you do that. And, and again, if the FDA is going to approve a device when it's only in people that are insured, um, you know, that may be something that needs to be changed at the FDA level. Um, but I do think there's, a, again, all of us as investigators that are at the table with those conversations, just like what's been said of continuing to ask the questions like, well, you know, we have Spanish speaking families, you know, everything needs to be done in Spanish for half the population, you know, of whatever, um, you know, that's come up quite a bit, you know, so we, we need to keep putting those at the forefront when we can. Um, and I think that's, that's exactly how it changes is just being all of us more aware and in ways that it comes up, take the opportunity to mention it. I know, I know we're, we're past the time, but I want to, um, if you can, if you can bear with me, I want to ask uh, a last question, uh, especially to our panelists. Um, and I'll, I want to remind also the audience that this session is being recorded and will be uh, posted on our website um, so that you can access it at any point in time afterwards. Um, but given, given the present times right now, um, this, this idea of, of activism around health uh, is sort of, I think, mm -hmm. surging uh, with a specific you know, level of importance. And um, as both of you are health advocates, I'm wondering, do you envision a situation, a future 
situation where the reality can be sort of flipped, where we see African American communities, minority communities, any type of communities, um, putting pressure on the research community to conduct clinical trials about the issues that are important to them. Um, you know, I'm reminded about this, this movement, this grassroots movement that emerged because of the AIDS crisis, this ACT UP um, activism organization that basically put enough pressure on the FDA, changed the way um, clinical trials were conducted because of course it was a life and death situation for that community, but they harnessed so much power that what do you think about that reality? Can we envision a future where communities will be the ones informing directly our scientific community on what they should be doing? I mean, I, abs I yes, absolutely can envision it. I, I think we, we, we see that has had happened in the past. And even if we just look at our current climate now, really, it, it, that's exactly what, what fosters change, but but I think what we need to do, and I think it goes back to something that I said initially, and I think Dr. Oru also mentioned, we do, do need definitely to have diversity in researchers and clinicians and coordinators, but also really within the communities expressing the importance of it. So we're building agendas, we're getting on, we're, we're building medical research education on the lay level. So we're get, getting the community to understand and, and teaching even advocacy skills. You know, that's an important component, I think, just even even, and, and I think that 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 even I learn on some levels is how do I advocate for what's what's best for me and my family and the community, and then what 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 do I need to do to make a bigger difference? And that's where our community organizers like Dr. Aru come into play. And, and and I'm not that, but 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 that but that how do we then utilize our voices to make changes? But what's important to us, not just individually as a community. And I think we can get there, but I think it but it also needs to have. Um, and I think I, what I see in, in our current is that I think we are, as a country, um, wanting change and ready for change, but we just have to continue continue the efforts and continue the fight and continue learning from one another. I think I think that's the biggest thing that we do. We, if we do not acknowledge the, the, the current state and the mistrust and the biases, it's nowhere. So we have to not only acknowledge it, but what do we need to do to work to, to educate one another to make a difference? Great, great. Thank you so much, Darcel. Um, I think um, Chioma got uh, internet, this got disconnected just for a, a little bit, so she didn't hear the question. I'll sum it up really quickly and give her a chance to respond, and I think then we can we can give some closure. Um, the question was whether you can envision a, a, a situation in the future where uh, the dynamic is flipped and we see. African American communities or minority communities um, putting pressure on the research community in terms of what clinical trials they should be doing that are of interest to them. Uh, and mentioning sort of the example of the ACT UP uh, grassroots movements around AIDS and whether you see that um, in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I'm a part of it in terms of COVID. Um, my dad, uh, you know, unfortunately passed away of COVID uh, in May. Uh, he's a person, he was a person with dementia. Um, and that has led me into activating because that's what I know how to do. Um, and I know that there are coalitions building up. Um, I'm part of one um, that's part of the Center for Popular Democracy um, that really just gathers, you know, weekly to talk, uh, you know, as families impacted by COVID and um, uh, the young lady, Kristen, I forget her name, but she spoke at the DNC um, on her father passing and started her her own nonprofit called Marked by COVID. I think those become natural partners around COVID vaccine and the like and the other. Like, and I think that's true for everything. And I'm a parent with autism of kids with autism. And you know, the parents of children with disabilities have been active forever. And so there are all these you know spaces that are existing in a community based on trauma, based on these experiences. And I think you can find that in 
pretty much any diagnostic category, even some of the like more rare diseases, people will find community in order to understand and process what has happened to them, what is happening to them. I think tapping into those spaces and investing, I mean, I don't think, I'll say this, I don't think it's going to happen without investment. I, I have a kid, <laughs> real life is happening right now. Um, one second. Uh, I'll just end up just saying that I think that it's important to make the proper investments um, in the community and help them understand like why research is important as part of whatever they decide their solutions are supposed to be. So I'm going to pause for <laughs> learning chaos. Hold on. Well, thank you, Dr. Oru. Those, those. And thank you to all of the panelists. This has been such a robust and such an informative discussion. And we thank you all. So thank you, Dr. Madison Burrell, Dr. Daisy Lee, Dr. Stephanie Salazar, Dr. Chioma Oru, and Ms. Darcel Jackson. We greatly appreciate you joining us today and have a great day.